Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we fold weird and wonderful science and deliver it directly to your neurons. I'm Ian Wolf. On this edition, Jasleen Singh talks about building nanotechnology devices to treat cancer. But first up, here's news of religion and polls. Atheists raise kinder kids. A study from the University of Chicago has found that children around the world raised in non-religious families are more altruistic, more compassionate, and care more about justice than punishment. Or to put it another way, on average, religion makes kids mean. Children raised in the absence of religion were more giving, generous, and forgiving. The study examined 1,170 children aged between 5 and 12 years in six countries. Canada, China, Jordan, Turkey, the USA and South Africa. Parents completed questionnaires about their religious beliefs and practices and what they think of their children's empathy and sensitivity to justice. From the questionnaires, three large groupings were established. Christian, Muslim, and not religious. Children from religious households of other faiths didn't reach a large enough sample size to be included in additional analyses. To measure altruism, children played a version of the dictator game, in which they were shown a set of 30 stickers and were told to choose their 10 favourites. Then they were told, these stickers are yours to keep, but... The experimenter doesn't have the time to play this game with all of the children. So, not everyone would be able to receive the stickers. The children were shown a set of envelopes and told they could give some of their stickers to another child, who would otherwise miss out, by putting them in one envelope. And then they could put the stickers they want to keep in the other envelope. Experimenters turned their back while the child chose and children were told to tell the experimenter when they were done. Altruism was calculated as the number of stickers shared out of 10. In general, the children were more likely to share as they got older. However, children from households identifying as Christian and Muslim were significantly less likely than children from non-religious households to share their stickers. This negative relationship between how religious the child's family are and how altruistic the children are, grew stronger with age. Children with a longer experience of religion in the household were the least likely to share. To measure morality, children watched short cartoons in which one character pushes or bumps another, either accidentally or on purpose. After seeing each situation, Children were asked about how mean the behaviour was and how much punishment the character deserved. Children from religious households favoured stronger punishments for antisocial behaviour and judged such behaviour more harshly than non-religious children. The questionnaires filled in by parents showed that religious parents punished antisocial behaviour at home more severely than non-religious parents. Perhaps it's unsurprising that unreligious parents' children wanted to be more punishing than compassionate, like their folks. Kids learn from what you do more than from what you say. Using surveys filled in by the parents, they measured the religiousness of their home and parent-reported child empathy and sensitivity to justice. The study found that family religious identification decreases children's altruistic behaviours and children from religious households are harsher in their punitive tendencies. 
that children raised in the absence of religion are more giving, more generous, and more forgiving. The religious children didn't become more moral and compassionate as they got older. Basically, the study found religious identification in families decreases children's altruistic behaviours. Religiousness predicts parent-reported child sensitivity to injustices and empathy, but not in the way they expect. Children from religious households are harsher in their punishing tendencies. The researchers conclude, together, these results reveal the similarity across countries and how religion negatively influences children's altruism. They challenge the view that religiosity facilitates pro-social behaviour and call into question whether religion is vital for moral development, suggesting the secularisation of moral discourse does not reduce human kindness. In fact, it does just the opposite. In other words, the evidence is that humans have become kinder, more selfless and more concerned for justice, despite religion, rather than because of it. The study, the negative association between religiousness and children's altruism across the world, was supported by a grant from the very religious John Templeton Foundation and published in the journal Current Biology. Rigged Polls Nobel Prize winning physicist Brian Schmidt has written in The Guardian that he found that the polls that predicted a Labour Party win for the Australian federal election were wrong because they were manipulated. When surveys or scientific measurements all have identical noise, then there's unconscious or deliberate fraud at play, because real measurements have different noise patterns. Professor Schmidt mathematically analysed the random parts of the pre-election poll data and found that they weren't random at all. Humans are very bad at creating genuinely random numbers in our heads, so you can detect fraud in scientific papers by mathematically analysing the sampling noise for genuine randomness. 16 different polls before the election predicted exactly the same numbers. The Liberal National Coalition winning 48 or 49% of the two-party preferred vote, with Labour winning 51% or 52% and winning the election. With no discussion of the uncertainties involved. The poll's wrong prediction not only affected people's expectation of the result of the election, but may also have affected the way they voted in the election itself. In the old days, you could conduct a pre-election poll by phoning people on their landline number that you found in the telephone company provided paper phone book. Today, Far fewer people have landlines, and the people who do are much less likely to answer your questions. So you get a sampling error, because you've only asked questions of a subset of people with landlines who will answer your questions. If you flip a coin ten times, you might expect a fair coin to give you heads five times. However, mathematics tells us that you'll only get five heads 25.2% of the time. When you apply these calculations to the 16 pre-election polls, you'll find the chances of these 16 polls coming in with the exact same small spread of answers is greater than 100,000 to 1 against. This proves the polls have been manipulated to give the same answer. Humans like to get the same answer as everyone else. This is called confirmation bias in science, and many experiments in physics are designed to hide the results from the experimenters during the experiment so that they can't unconsciously change things to come out the way they expect. Professor Schmidt suggests that perhaps all the polling companies unconsciously change the data to match each other. However, given the Liberal National Coalition had Australian billionaire Clive Palmer spending $60 million in anti-Labour advertising, an American billionaire, Rupert Murdoch, had all Australian TV channels, radio stations and newspapers pushing anti-Labour messages, it's worth considering whether there was any kind of deliberate strategy. Certainly, the disillusionment of progressive voters disappointed by the promises of faked polls has worked to the Conservative politicians' favour, with many progressive voters choosing to disengage from politics in despair. I don't think the Conservative parties are that clever. 
that pre-election polling companies need to urgently find out how they unconsciously faked their results to the same matching wrong predictions with the same matching non-random sampling noise. If they don't, nobody will take them seriously ever again. They have three years. the Cognitive Bias song by Brad Ray from his YouTube channel. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Medical nanotechnology. Jaslene Singh is a PhD student at the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Sydney. She's working on nanotechnology devices to treat cancer. We sat on a bench in Victoria Park, and I began by asking her, what is DNA origami? DNA origami is basically a method used to build DNA nanostructures. So the idea is you have a long DNA strand, and you fold it into a particular shape, like how you would do with paper origami and you have shorter DNA strands that act as staples to hold this long strand in that particular shape. And so you're working with DNA as your building block? Yes, I'm working with DNA as my building block. I mean, we are really familiar with DNA as a genetic material, but in what I do, I do not use it as a genetic material at all. It's solely a building block. And this is possible because DNA has this thing called base pairing, so like there are four bases, A pairs with D and C pairs with Gs. So think of this like Velcro that stick together very specifically. And we use this to form DNA origami, where you can program the DNA sequences such that when you have many sequences of the right base pairs, they all come together into a specific shape. And this shape has been pre-designed using a computer software. And so what are you using this to do? So in my case, I'm using it to 
from DNA barrels. So they are, these are just like hollow cylinders and loading them with cancer drugs and specifically sending them to cancer cells. So I'm trying to achieve a targeted cancer therapy using DNA origami. And this is made possible because with DNA nanostructures, I can functionalize them with specific molecules that can recognize cancer cells but not healthy cells. So if you think of how this works, is like, think of cancer cells and healthy cells being two different houses. They may have similar doors, but the lock to each door is different. So they have different locks. And I functionalize my DNA origami with the right key that only opens the door to the cancer cell, but not to the healthy cells. And so the DNA doesn't get absorbed by the body straight away. It's able to stay around long enough to find the right locks to find the cancer. So that's a very good question. One of the big research areas in like DNA nanotechnology is stabilizing the DNA because um, your body t generally tends to attack foreign DNA and like degrade it. So a lot of work is going on to like stabilizing the DNA using different methods. So and that's a part of my PhD project as well, where I'm stabilizing it such that it's long enough in the blood for it to be able to reach its target. So is that a matter of fighting off the parts of the body that are trying to absorb it? Uh, one mechanism is you coat it with another polymer or something. So it's like decepting the body that this is not something you want to attack and that protects it. Another method that was recently shown by the d lab is they stabilize the bonds between the DNA instead of just the base pairing. They form a different kind of covalent bonding using um, UV light. And this kind of stabilizes the DNA such that if it wants to break, it can't break apart because it's held together by the bonds. So that's the other method. And so your little origami shape goes along with an anti-cancer drug on the inside and a little key to match up with the cancer on the outside. And what happens when it finds the cancer? So the idea is when the key recognizes the lock on the cancer cell, it's taken into the cancer cell, into this tiny compartment called endosomes. So the origami enters the endosome. And at this point, there's another barrier, which is escaping the endosome to release the drug. So we have been working on this thing called a nanopore within our DNA origami barrel. So the idea is that inside the endosome, the pH is slightly more acidic than the rest of the cell, like than the outside of the cell. So we have like pH switches within the barrel that kind of releases the nanopore such that it pokes into the endosome. And the idea is that this creates holes in the endosome and it just disrupts the endosome and the drug is released into the cytosol. And is cancer the only illness that you're trying to treat this way? In the scope of my PhD, yes, I'm ah. just focusing on cancer, but this is possible. You can use DNA origami to target other diseases, such as Alzheimer's or like heart disease. You just have to change the key that you use to target like other locks. And how did you come to be doing this kind of work? What inspired you? So I did engineering, chemical engineering. In my undergraduate, during my honours thesis, I happened to fall upon a project that was related to DNA nanotechnology. It was basically a comprehensive review of DNA nanotechnology. That's when I got into reading about this field and I really liked it. I was like, it would be cool to do something related to this. And a year later, I decided to do my PhD in this field. And so you're building tiny, tiny machines. How small are DNA origami devices? So this DNA origami devices are at the nanoscale, which is like 1,000, 2,000 times smaller than a human hair. So the devices that I'm working with are like 30 by 30 nanometers. They're like really tiny. But for certain applications, you need like larger DNA origami structures. So I have a colleague who is working on making larger structures in the micron scale. And so how do you go about making the structures? Obviously, there's a lot of work in designing your actual device that's going to be folded up. But can you run us through the process a little bit? So you've got your design, which is obviously a large part of the work. And then how do you make it from the design? 
So I think the more difficult part is the design part, yes. which was done. And like once you have the design, we basically order our DNA strands from a DNA manufacturing company. And once we get the strands, we just mix all the right strands together in a little tube. And then we place the tube in a PCR machine and we heat it up to say 95 degrees Celsius. So this temperature, this thermal energy provides it with uh, the energy it needs to come together. And 18 hours later or 24 hours later, we take it out and we already have our origami in that tube. So we just purify the origami and image it using electron microscopy. So it folds up when you mix it together and heat it? Yes, that's right. That's when it folds. So the good thing is we don't really have to interfere with the process. It's quite automated. It's one step. So that's why DNA origami is useful for this. Can you talk a little bit about how you do the design work? So for the design part, we use a software called Cat Nano. So you input the kind of structure that you want, the shape, and roughly you can adjust it to form a specific size. And then that software kind of spits out the sequences that you need to order to match up with the scaffold, to fold the scaffold in a specific way. So is this something you could see high school students playing with in the future? I think, yes, high school students could play with like some basic designs. And then if you want to form like larger, more complex structure, you might need to use a bit of programming, like Python and stuff. So probably. Would there be simple structures that you could make? I mean, when you're learning this, obviously you had to learn. When you're learning, are there simple structures or simple devices that you make that you can tell that it's done something at the simplest level? Well, the simplest structure would be to make a 2D structure, for example, a 2D rectangle. And that's like pretty straightforward to do. So that's something you could do with Ken. I know if you're trying to learn it initially. And to see if it's made, basically you image it with electron microscopy and it should show you whether you are successful or not. Because it seems like one of those things where normally in programming or when you're making things, you don't have such a long... Well, in your case, from the description you've got, you, you design it all in the program and then you have to wait for it to come and arrive through the post before you can finally make it. So there's this yeah. delay. Do you think that will put off people learning? When we speak about delay, it's about a week or two, which in my opinion, like in terms of a PhD, which is like three, four years long, it doesn't seem too long. It's not too bad. I don't think it would put off people from learning. The other the thing that might put off people from applying it, for example, teachers teaching high school students how to use it, might be the cost of the DNA, which is still quite high. So I think that's a bigger concern compared to the time it takes for the DNA to arrive. And I guess there'd be simulators too. So again, if you're just in the learning environment and not in actually making stuff like you are, then you could just use the CAD program and then see the simulated results. Yes, that's right. You could just use the CAD Nano program to design your DNA origami. And there's this other open software called CanDo, which kind of shows you what shape it will take. So that's a good simulation program. And that's what we tend to do before we actually take it to the lab. And so your project is putting the drugs in a little device that will then open up when it gets to the right place and is taken inside the cancer cell. What other things can you do with this sort of technology? So one of the biggest advantage of DNA origami is that you can, it's very addressable. As I was mentioning before, you fold the scaffold strand using many staple strands. So each of the staple strand is individually addressable, which means you can manipulate each of the staple strand and functionalize it with something different. So the good thing about this is it allows for multiplexing. You can have many different proteins or molecules on your DNA origami structure. And the other big advantage is that you not just can multiplex it, but you can know the exact distance between proteins or other molecules. And this is very beneficial for understanding biological system, not just for drug delivery. Using DNA origami, you can place the protein such that you can understand the effect of the distance between the protein on the disease. This might not be possible in like at the micro scale. If you're just testing the proteins and seeing what happens, you might not know the effect of having the proteins next to each other. 
So that's the other thing. So I think DNA origami has a lot of potential in terms of cancer therapeutics and other nanomedicine applications, for example, biosensing or understanding a specific disease. But there are several things that needs to be addressed first, for example, the stability of the nanostructures. And I think as a DNA nano community, we are together working towards that, to improving the DNA origami system. Well, Jasleen, thank you very much. Thank you, Yen. That was Jasleen Singh, PhD candidate at the University of Sydney's School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering, designing self-folding DNA nanotechnology devices to seek out cancer cells and kill them while leaving the rest of the body unharmed. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Do you have a science outreach grant that you should tell me to apply for? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolfe. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, 2XXFM in Canberra, and my local station, 2RDJ in Burwood, New South Wales. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 950 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.